uh, visual function. And of course, there are very many other illusions, again, uh, testing me to the same thing. Now, of course, this also very much relates to, well, the fact that we group and bind and combine different elements in the scene. Of course, this has already been known from the early, early 20th century in our Gestalt psychology, uh, where it was very meticulously studied what rules govern this kind of grouping. Gestalt, also, Gestalt laws of organization uh, showing, uh, well, for example, you, know, you have the tendency to, to group these line segments into a single object, a single line, because they are collinear, because they have the same orientation, stuff like that. Uh, and then you might say <laughs> at the pinnacle of all this is, of course, you have a complete interpretation of the scene as a whole. Perceptual organization, this is what we call perceptual organization. Well, you combine all these low and high level features into figures and ground, into the specific objects that are there. This, you might say, is the, I don't know, maybe the end goal of what visual cortex or visual system is doing. And some have called this things like the 2 and a half d sketch. Uh, and you see lots of things going on there, of course. As I said, interactions of Gestalt laws, some Gestalt laws uh, overruling other Gestalt laws. So it's a very dynamic and intricate system. But all, these all the different information from the scene comes together to, well, create your final percepts. And indeed, you know, as, the, as these kinds of examples show, uh, shows, the Dalma famous Dalmatian dog, it's, ve it's very dynamic, but it's also something in which learning is apparently involved a lot. All right, so can we map these, 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 these visual functions onto specific neural processes? Uh, well, I think we can. Uh, of course, what uh, oh, uh, actually Peter and I have done, what is it? It's already 20 years ago, Peter, we're getting old. <laughs> uh, I have done this, uh, uh, identify this, what we call feed, fast feed forward sweep, uh, which is actually a very remarkable feature of the visual system. And so you present a visual system, you present a visual stimulus, and within something like 80 to 100 milliseconds, the information from this visual stimulus speeds through the visual, uh, visual stream, activating different successive different visual areas, well, very briefly after one another. So it's typically only 10 milliseconds between one visual area and the next. So there's, one, there's basically one spike, given a maximum spike frequency of 100, mi of 100 hertz. But uh, even so, the ve these very first spikes that are fired by these neurons already express their tuning properties. And so say an orientation selective cell is already orientation selective from the very first spike it fires. Most face selective cells are face selective from the very first spikes they fire. So this, of course, indicates that it is all mediated by feed-forward connections. It cannot be otherwise. This is why this is called the fast feed-forward sweep. Now, what does this fast feed-forward sweep enable? Well, for one thing, these low-level feature extractions, orientation selectivity, direction selectivity, things like that. Also, also these base groupings, uh, and also lots of high-level feature uh, extractions. As I mentioned, phase selectivity is something which is already present uh, during these very first spikes, so enabled by this fast feed-forward sweep. And then of course, you can imagine that somehow this will also enable you to do very fast and very efficient visually guided action. Uh, like example that's often given, of course, if you, have, if you have to return a tennis ball that served at you at, say, what is it nowadays, 150 miles per second, uh, per, sorry, per <laughs> 150 miles per hour, uh, yeah, this only gives you so little time to really respond to that and you know, hit, uh, hit a, a proper return. This can only be done by such a feed-forward system, uh, basically. Yeah, so, uh, but of course, this, this only holds for a limited yeah, uh, a, a limited time of, of processing that can be done by these uh, feature de extractions, base groupings, high-level feature extractions. All right. Uh, now, if we look at these other processes, you know, where we combine the information from different parts of the visual scene, so interference, perceptual inference, uh, gestalt grouping, figure ground organization, these have been shown to typically re require, uh, well, either horizontal connections within the visual system, uh, or which are displayed here. Uh, so this is, a, but this is a particular cell receiving feed-forward information. And then you have these horizontal interactions feeding onto that cell, with, which enables that cell to get information from distant parts of the visual field, 
or feedback connections coming from higher uh, parts of the visual, uh, higher parts of the visual system. Uh, by the way, this is a, I think the most beautiful example of how these, for example, horizontal connections enable a particular gestalt law of perceptual organization. Uh, so these are what you see here is that that's, uh, this is the orientation, well, I guess you know, the orientation map of the, of, of the visual cortex. Cells of a specific orientation tend to be much more connected to cells with a similar orientation preference at other parts of the visual field, which is, of course, exactly what this gestalt law of similarity is doing. Uh, you group elements with the same orientation, much more likely than... Uh, so that's, that's basically how these gestalt laws are implemented. But, of course, others also require feedback connections. Of course, I've done a lot of work showing that uh, perceptual organization, particularly in the kind of, with the kind of stimuli that I've, I've used, indeed requires these kinds of feedback connections. Uh, so uh, I'll, I'll get into a, a little bit more detail about that in a, in a second. But yeah, well, I'll say roughly speaking, you could argue, or you could, or you could say, that these different visual functions uh, so, uh, so uh, map onto these two different systems. Uh, so you have uh, simple and high-level feature detection, maybe also, the, well, not maybe, also these base groupings, uh, which are primarily mediated by feed-forward connections, uh, so connections going from low-level areas to high-level areas. And then these other functions, uh, particularly these ones, gestalt grouping, long-range and, uh, and complex figure ground organization, that typically requires uh, recurrent processing, as we called it, and because this combination of horizontal and feedback processing, that is what we call recurrent processing. Uh, and then there are, yeah, well, if you look at the literature, it's a bit, you know, there's some if, uh, inter interference effects, some inference effects that, yeah, it, it depends a bit on what studies you look at, but that de either depend on a bit of feed forward or a bit of combination of both or something. It's a, it's a bit of a shady area, but it's, so that's somewhere in between, I would say. Okay. Well, as I said, you know, this is, of course, the old example. I guess you, I guess <laughs> you all know that. But it's, a, it's actually a very beautiful example of this distinction between these feed, these, these feed forward activations and the recurrent processing. Yeah? So you have these two stimuli, receptor cells lying there. And if you look at the first uh, uh, 100 milliseconds of activation, indeed, these cells only look at what happens within the receptive field, the feed forward activation. And because they, they respond identically to this stimulus and this stimulus. But then after 100 milliseconds, you see that the activity in primary visual cortex in this case, these are all monkey recordings by the way, it gets modulated by the more global visual context, in this case the figure ground organization of such a scene. Uh, because what you also see is that if you look at the, how this, this elevation of activity spreads over the whole scene, you'll see that it, you know, the, the figure typically gets elevated over the whole background. It's yeah, something I did like a uh, hundred years ago. All right. <laughs> uh, We've also shown that this really reflects figure ground organization because if you use much more complex scenes like these strange stimuli where you, where you perceive something like this, a so floating square in the middle or a frame uh, hovering around it. You know, this, of course, from a more local perspective, these things are the same in terms of, let's say, orientation contrast. But from a global perceptual perspective, indeed, you know, you have very different percepts from these. And indeed, this, this, these modulations that you get depend on that more, much more global percept. And what we've also shown is that, indeed, this depends on feedback. Yeah, so lesions from excess in exercise areas tend to abolish this feedback modulation and the figure ground organization and what have you. <coughs> By the way, what has also shown is that these feed forward and feedback systems employ, possibly, different neurotransmitter systems. Yeah, so, for example, the, uh, the, uh, the feedback signals uh, tend to be blocked by NMDA receptor blockers like APV, whereas the feed forward systems uh, tend to... Uh, uh, are not blocked by that, but they are blocked by uh, an MPA receptor blocker. Uh, so, apparently there are also some more subtle differences, maybe molecular differences between these two systems. All right, so we, ha we have these, uh, these visual functions, the neural processes associated with it. And of course, now the question is, how do these visual processes depend on conscious versus unconscious processes? That's, of course, the question. Now, as I said, there is a... Uh, yeah, there are different ways, of course, to manipulate conscious perception. Uh, I think they fall broadly in two classes. Uh, so you have all these manipulations which typically interfere with, well, what you could call visibility. Uh, so, uh, 
Well, of course, anesthesia does that, but <laughs> that does a lot more other things. But uh, typically, if you use, if you do experiments, things like masking or dicoptic masking, continuous flash suppression, rivalry, those are all examples of manipulations that interfere with the visibility. Meaning that if you have a subject, you know, for example, if you if you, if you look at masking, if you have a subject sitting at, in front of a screen and uh, of a screen and the stimulus is masked, and the only thing the subject has to do is push a button whenever he sees it and push a button when uh, another button when he doesn't see it, yeah, then a, a properly masked stimulus, you know, a subject will then be at, well, either D prime zero, yeah, which is what we call objective invisibility, or if you use these perceptual awareness scales, you, you know, they can be at what's called perceptual awareness scale zero, indicating that his subjective visibility of that scene, well, is absent. Yeah, so, and typically, if you look at the literature a bit, uh, these objective visibilities indeed seem to be a more strict, harsh, you might say, criterion than these subjective visibilities. Typically, thresholds for subjective visibility is a little bit higher. Uh, and then, of course, there's these subjectively conscious. But then, of course, uh, what can also happen is that you use what's called an, uh, a manipulation, not so much of this visibility, but of attention. And then you enter a completely different domain. Uh, because now you don't have a subject just confronted with one stimulus, but typically with more. And then, you know, he attends one or the other, and then something happens with the others. And, of course, <laughs> typical uh, uh, examples of that would be, well, attentional blink, change blindness, inattentional blindness manipulations. Uh, now, of course, you could argue, well, these are all manipulations of conscious experience. And, indeed, there's nothing against that. Uh, but I, I think it's useful to, uh, well, to distinguish between these two. And I'll also explain why, and also show some... Results why, uh, which are <laughs> these basically. So what I did, uh, actually already five years ago, but I did a, re, uh, a fresher version of it uh, recently and also a much smaller version, so it's easier to read, uh, on you know, how these visual functions that I discussed are interfered with either by these visibility manipulations, uh, and then of course you, know, you have uh, uh, different versions, uh, or attention. And you get a pretty clear picture uh, on how these manipulations indeed have very different effects on these visual functions. Uh, so if we look at the fully invisible, so that's really below D prime zero, etc., or in deep anesthesia, so experiments like that, then what you typically only are left with is, you know, this feature extraction and categorization. I think that's something that most people will agree to. Uh, it's Particularly if you, if, you, if you apply these harsh criteria, so D prime zero and what have you, uh, you will typically also not find these in, in interference and inference effects. Uh, you, do, you may find those when you know, the criterion is a bit more loose, like in these subjective invisibility situations. Uh, and of course, if something is visible, well, they, well, if something is visible, reported, and attended, of course you get all of these. I mean, that's you know, what basic vision is about. But what's also qu uh, quite surprising is that if you manipulate attention instead of these visibility things, you do, not you do not lose any of these visual functions. There's not a single visual function, visual function, <laughs> I should say, so the function that I just mentioned, uh, that's interfered with by inattention. So let me give a, uh, uh, a few examples of the, of, the, of the results I just showed. Uh, so, uh, of course, what we have shown, shown in the past, also already like 20 years ago, is that indeed this feed-forward activation of visual cortex, which is shown here, uh, so it's not interfere with, with whether uh, animals report, see, uh, report stimulus being seen or not seen, but the recurrent activation is very, is very, selectively, uh, is very selectively absent when uh, stimuli are not seen, so that's uh, indicating that these recurrent interactions are indeed very much dependent on seen versus not seen. This is a masking experiment. We've done this in monkeys, uh, monkeys but also in humans, in using EEG, fMRI, what have you. Uh, uh, indeed showing that, uh, again, these recurrent interactions are very much, and of course then also the figure ground organization is very much <laughs> dependent on uh, whether monkeys and or, and or humans indeed see these mass stimuli. Uh, this is the situation with anesthesia, so they get, you, know, you get clear activation of cells in, in, in primary visual cortex, also in other visual areas. For example, face selective cells, you can also get that in during anesthesia. But again, these recurrent interactions uh, mediating, mediating perceptual organization are selectively absent 
during anesthesia. Well, feed forward processing is independent of all these. So that basically is about this part of the graph, uh, in it indicating that all these things which have to do with perceptual organization are indeed absent uh, when things are subjectively or objectively invisible. Now, they are, uh, as shown here, present, uh, uh, or let me, let me phrase it differently, independent of attention. This is something we already observed already also quite a while ago, in the sense that if you look at these modulations, so these contraction modulations, this figure ground organization modulation, you will see that the, the, the strength of the modulation does not depend on the number of objects that you show to the, to the animal. And so we varied one to four objects in this case, monkey had then do a change blindness task, so they had to, you know, uh, uh, look a bit at, the, at these different objects. But as you can see, the modulation is equally strong, figure out modulation, whether you have one, two, or four objects. So it has, well, at least up to this number, no capacity limit. Uh, we did, uh, more recently we also did uh, quite a few experiments showing how, indeed, inattention, so inattention paradigms, or yeah, we mostly did inattention pa paradigms, do not interfere with, for example, the processing of these Kinesa figures. Uh, so what you, what you get here is that the orange uh, is always the, uh, the, the signal you get for these Kinesa-like figures, and the other ones are different controls, where we controlled for not only, you know, this is the classical control where you have the, the inducers uh, inside out, but we also use these kinds of controls where, of course, here you also have this collinearity that you also have with the canister, but of course, in this case, you do not really have the canister percept, you might say. So that's, you know, that we typically tend to use those kinds of controls. And as you can see, you get this difference between the canisters and the other ones, just as well for the inattention. Yeah, this is the, no, this is the non-inattention case, so this is the attended case, and this is the inattended case, so it doesn't really matter. These visual functions, the visual function of extracting the canister thingy, is present just as well for the inattended as the attended case. Actually, recently, uh, Johannes Farnsford did a really nice experiment combining masking with attentional blink to really drive home this point that there is a real difference between masking and, and inattention. Uh, so again, he used these Kinesa figures with all, lots of controls and uh, all sorts of other things. Uh, very fairly complicated experiment, actually, he did, but let me uh, sum it down to the basics. Uh, so. He had these, these Kinesa things, uh, well, either masked or unmasked, and then in an attentional blink or not in an attentional blink, uh, by means of short lags and long lags. Uh, and what he also had was that he used uh, uh, stimuli with different contrasts, just low level contrast, yeah, so more or less black, you might, <laughs> you might say. Uh, and of course, there's this difference between, in this case, you have this integration, as he calls it, or perceptual organization, or at least, you know, perceptual inference. And in these cases, you do not have that. And then he tried to decode from the EEG signals, you know, the contrast, whether, whether you could detect the contrast from the EEG signals, whether you could detect the uh, perceptual integration from these signals. And that's what you get here. Uh, so the contrast you can detect quite early, not surprisingly, of course, with a maximum uh, detect uh, detectability or decodability, I should say, uh, at 92 milliseconds. And this perceptual integration, inference, I would call it, uh, maximally at 265 milliseconds, but it starts a bit early, of course, already. Uh, so apparently these have different timings, just like all the monkey experiments we did, of course. Uh, but now you look at the difference between masked and uh, attentionally blinked, uh, and, what, uh, and that's what you get here. So if you mask stuff, you selectively get rid of this integration signal, uh, so you cannot decode the difference between kinesis and non-kinesis anymore. But of course, you don't lose the difference between low and high contrast. That's still going on in these mass situations. Whereas in the, uh, the attentional blink, you can still decode the perceptual inference, the integration, what have you. And so the difference between kinesis and non-kinesis. Uh, so this is a very nice example of, uh, you know, um, indeed very different effects of these kinds of manipul manipulations, this is a ma like masking, and these kinds of manipulations. In fact, there's as I said, there's no single uh, visual function that's really interfered with by inattention or lack of access or lack of reportability. Uh, so, uh, but of course there is a clear transition uh, so that visibility manipulations primarily interfere with visual functions which are indeed related to perceptual organizations like these ones or maybe also these ones. Uh, so where you have to integrate the information over large, larger distances across the visual field but it doesn't interfere with basic categorizations. So there's a clear transition 
visual functions that can occur, well, unconsciously, as opposed to visual functions that cannot occur unconsciously. But there is no such transition uh, if you look at attention. Attention access is not required for any visual function to be executed. Of, of course, although it may modulate the strength of visual functions. However, I'm not denying that attention has any effects on visual cortex. Of course it does. It may strengthen these or what have you. But when you look at the visual functions that are executed, they're executed in both inattended and attended cases. And so now we have this situation, so feed forward act activation. And we have these basic categorizations, visual recurrent processing, we have these integration phenomena. And of course, th th these come in very different shapes, you know, you have contextual modulation, as I've shown, you have the N200, you have the visual awareness negativity, it does fall all within the same domain, I would say. And then, of course, you have this frontal parietal activation, which is about global workspace ignition, P3B, what have you. Uh, apparently, yeah, well, not uh, uh, necessary, at least, for any of these functions. Uh, and of course, and so the, the so indeed, from that perspective, inattention is a really different beast compared to invisibility. Yeah, so, uh, attendant versus inattendant is where is you know the dichotomy between those two is what is is lying there. The dichotomy between invisible and visible is lying there. Now, of course, then, yeah, <laughs> the real question is where does the ma magic happen? Yeah, so, where do we become conscious of any of these perceptual organizations or what have you? Uh, where this phenomenology, uh, phenomenology gets explained. That's, of course, uh, 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 yeah, uh, the question. Well, I think in that respect, it's important to look at these no-report paradigms because it has been shown qu uh, recently quite, uh, in quite a few studies now that this global ignition, this, these, uh, the, fr uh, fr the frontal activation, all these things that are associated with this stage uh, are indeed much more strongly associated with the report or maybe the storing in, mem in memory, or anything cognitive, <laughs> than with the perception per se. Uh, so, for example, this is uh, a work showing that if you have binocular rivalry switches, if you have to uh, report these switches, you get frontal activation, but if you just have to look at them and nothing else, and then these switches occur as well, of course, but, and they monitor these switches by means of uh, looking at the opto uh, optokinetic nystagmus that these switches tend to evoke, because the, the two stimuli that were switched were bars moving either this way or this way, and then you get optokinetic nystagmus. You get these optokinetic nystagmus effects also when people do not report these, uh, these switches, uh, and then you don't get the prefrontal activation. Yeah, so people have these switches, perceptual switches, they just don't have to report them, then you get rid of the frontal activation. Other, other examples, you know, just recently Cohen uh, reported that P3B is not a marker of conscious experience, just a report. So th this is a very, a very simple experiment actually. People just had to report stuff or not, or report a mass stimulus or not. They did two versions. And uh, yeah, well, simple thing being that, you know, in the uh, no report condition, you primarily get this occipital activation, whereas in the report condition, you get all this frontal stuff, P3B and what have you. This is another example from inattention paradigms. Again, P3 coma components are about memory report, not about conscious experience. So here we have uh, an inattentional blindness and no report situation. Then you get this activation. Then now people are becoming aware of, you know, that these inattentional blindness things were there. Uh, well, pretty much the same. And then when they have to report them, you get this additional P3 uh, kind of activity. So uh, I think that uh, uh, clearly, uh, advocates the position that, you know, this is where phenomenology get ex gets explained. Of course, also, I mean, it gets explained also, of course, because the essence of phenomenology, the essence of having a conscious percept is, of course, that we have one conscious percept, which is unified, where we see one particular scene where all the information get in gets integrated. That's, that's maybe the key explanatum of conscious experience. Yeah, so where we, go, where we go from all these shattered bits of information to a complete integrated whole. This is typically what phenomenology is about, I would say. Uh, and of course, that gets quite readily explained by this integration of features and all these mechanisms that I talked about. And it's actually quite hard to understand what this frontal stuff would actually add to that, particularly given that they don't, they're not necessary for any of these visual functions to occur. Uh, so what would be the, say, explanatory power of adding global workspace ignition or frontal activity to all this visual stuff. It wouldn't explain anything really about phenomenology. Of course, it would explain a lot, 
about you using this visual information, this visual scene that you now have processed for, oh, what have you, report, memory, integrating it with actions and all sorts of other things. That's readily explained, of course, by this global ignition. But the phenomenology itself, I don't think, I don't see at least why it would get explained by that. Uh, because it happens regardless of uh, attention, access and report. So I would say this is unconscious, this is conscious, and this is accessed and reported. And of course that's immediately linked to this P versus A consciousness story. Uh, of course you could frame this in two ways. I was a bit, a bit well, stuck between a rock and a hard place when I heard Ollie Stark, uh, uh, what was it, two days ago, because you know she advocated that if you are a functionalist then you are a dualist. Of course other people say that if you are not a functionalist then you are outside of science. So I was sort of, you know, where am I now? <laughs> So uh, I thought, well, uh, let's not care too much about it. I'll just you know, continue doing experiments. But anyhow, the functionalist, the functionalist conclusion is, you know, conscious visual experience arises with perceptual organization or binding, grouping, integration. You know, there are different versions, of course, of this. This is where conscious experiences arises. And of course, the physicalist conclusion would be conscious visual experiences arises when, with the transition from feed forward to recurrent processing. And, but of course, you know, to me, they're all just the same. And of course, this is very much related to this whole story of you know, distilling NCC precursors from the true NCC and the consequences of the NCC. Yeah, so I would say, you know, this is, all, this, is, this is where global ignition and what have you sits. This is where reentrant processing in visual cortex sits. And that's where the and unconscious processing of is, of course, feeds forward. Of course, it also relates very much to this overflow debate. Yeah, so indeed, visual cortex is much better able to process a whole scene with lots of objects in them, much more than the capacity of working memory, attention, and, and report. Uh, and of course, that's you know why we have these uh, we have we have this change blindness phenomenon, where you know you have this rich representation of a scene, but if you present a new one, well, this rich representation is immediately erased because it has no memory; it just just has phenomenology. And then, of course, yeah, yeah, of course, you don't see the difference. <laughs> that's actually not quite surprising to me. Uh, and of course, we did a lot of experiments using these partial report uh, uh, or, or this. These, these post queuing and pre queuing experiments, well, if not, maybe you should read about them, but uh, indicating that indeed we have a very rich representation sitting somewhere at least in our brain of the scene as a whole. It's not impoverished, it's not just, uh, so we've done lots of experiments showing uh, that these representations without access or report, uh, you can probe their pre precision, you, pr you can probe whether subjects really knew what the item was that was in fragile or iconic memory, we did all sorts, of, all sorts of experiments like that, really showing that this rich, widespread ph uh, phenomenal representation which sits in visual cortex is indeed, you know, about pretty much the whole scene. It's not, it's not just like it's really about many objects. Uh, Showing detail, precision, grouping, inference, what have you. And so we also did things like that, showing that they have inference. I'll be right. Of course, this also relates to the already, yeah, age-old discussion about the cognitive impenetrability of perception. Uh, we know that, you know, for example, even if I tell you that this is the same wavelength as, as this, you cannot see it like that. Uh, so all the access or all the cognition you want cannot change that percept which is of course also very much related to this whole story. Uh, and of course I mentioned this uh, thing about uh, the, the differences between feed, feed forward and recurrent processing. I think that also hints to another uh, thing which is maybe related to a question that was, that was asked about you know why would we have phenomenal experience without any cognitive function? Well for one thing, I do, I do think it has a function being, you know, perceptual organization being what, what, what gives you, uh, but why would we need perceptual organization, you might argue? Well, of course, to use the organized percept in a cognitive sense. But it could also be that because of these differences in neurotransmitter systems, that anything that gives you phenomenal experience at the same time, much more, it's much more readily to activate uh, these NMDA receptor type uh, interactions and thereby enable learning. So that you get visual learning from things that you have phenomenal experience of, Whereas you get no f uh, visual learning from things that you do not have phenomenal visual experience of. So that would sort of indicate a link between perception and perceptual learning. Just an idea. Thank you. Thank you, yeah. uh, very interesting.
Um, so there was this slide where you differentiated between visible, visible, and uh, attended and unattended. Yeah. And it seems to me as if, so I wanted to ask um, about the visible part, which is unattended. So for example, in uh, inattentional blindness, people report not seeing the gorilla or yeah. what have you. So in what terms is it visible if they don't yeah. see it? Yeah, well, of course, the point with inattentional blindness is that they report the invisibility like five minutes later or <laughs> so. But not in this experiment, but in others, they can report it even just immediately after being presented with it. Or in, uh, in for example, attention in, atten in attention and blink, um, right after they are presented with the two targets. No, that's not true. If you, if, 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 you don't, if, you don't, if you have nothing after T2, yeah. and, you, and, and you then ask about it, the people are way better than if, you have I than if it's masked. But th there are instances where they don't see it. Right? Possible, but uh, so. But, but my question is: yeah. Would you call it invisible just because the so the fact that the manipulation is is is, is via attention and people still say I don't see it? Would you reckon that this is visible? Yeah. Well, uh, actually, uh, yeah. I'm, uh, as most of you probably knew, no, I'm fully prepared to bite that bullet. So yeah, I know, I know, but I, yeah. I, I would like you to defend. So this is something yeah. I've been so struggling so with so for so a long so time. So, so indeed, you. this being a case where. Uh, how do you say that people underestimate their conscious experience? Yeah, indeed. Yeah. Peter? Yeah, so I, I have a question about, so you made a strong claim that perceptual organization does not require attention, and of course I have to disagree. So in, in, the, in the figure ground task, we demonstrated yeah. that if the monkey look attends elsewhere, you, get, you still get the boundaries, but you get much less of the figure ground modulation in the center of the figure. And there are other cases, like in curve tracing, where you're completely unable to do anything without attending. So you <coughs> then really lose the ability to do the grouping. So in that case, there's a very clear correspondence between what you can group and what you attend. So I wonder how you kind of fit that into your framework. Yeah, so with the, uh, I, thi I think the, the, the fact that you can modulate the figure ground signal by means of attention, that's something I would never deny. Of course you can. Uh, so, but the, but but what, uh, that's why I framed this, of course, also in terms of visual functions. Th apparently, the visual function itself of the figure ground organization uh, still is happening in the case of the uh, in, in the case of inattention. Uh, so, uh, uh, yeah. So, as I said, you can modulate these 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 modulations <laughs> with attention, but they don't require attention. Of course, in the curve tracing in the curve tracing curve tracing case. Uh, yeah, that's. I, I have to admit that's that's uh, that's a more difficult thing. But of course, that's also quite a peculiar <laughs> task. I would say. I mean, it's uh, you, you 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 present a stimulus where you have you know a fixation spot, and then you have the uh, one trace going this way, one trace going this way, and then one of the. Yeah. What so what what your what your results suggest is that to be able to trace this connection from the fixation point to the to the fixation uh, circuit target requires attention uh, yeah that that's po possibly true probably true uh, very likely to <laughs> very likely true uh, yeah that's that's a problem I will admit that sure Absolutely. Victor, a bit more. Uh, yeah my great talk um, <coughs> first of all well done on the um, uh, uh, the uh, emphasis on reporting I have to agree with that Okay. The, the, but I, I want to I make one comment and then support another thing you said at the very end. The, the, the sweep back, okay, I, mean, I think we always have to remember that the, these long-range feedback connections never confer the properties of the cells feeding back on the targets that they're feeding back to. So I really like the idea that what, you, that what this sweep back is doing is effectively tagging circuits for further computation or even to somehow allow the uh, downstream structures to know the source of the evidence leading to that report in the first place. And, and, and I think that calling it plasticity is, um, um, this is where I want you to answer me. Are you committed to, to referring to it as plasticity or might it well be that the, that the mechanisms studied in the names of heavy and learning and synaptic plasticity are really doing uh, a much larger uh, and perhaps more important job in, the, in, the, um, in ongoing processing? I'm not entirely sure whether I understand the question, but the but the of course I'm not saying that you know the 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 feedback activation is is solely for the purpose of 
of learning or, and, and plasticity. Of course, it's just for the processing of the visual scene so that you can interpret this scene as a whole and, uh, and that you get perceptual <coughs> organization. But going along with that, because there are these reentrant connections, of course, they are much more likely to satisfy HEP rules and then engage in, uh, and then you have an NMDA receptor activation, etc. So that, that you're much more prone to learn from percepts that are organized than from percepts that are unorganized. I don't know whether this answers the question, but... Yeah, I think, I think we should think more openly about what the functional role is of these long-range uh, uh, feedback is in, in, in terms of producing long-lasting potentials that are detectable on EEG and local field potentials and might serve other functions than just the processing through recurrence, which I think will probably not hold because you really don't have those signals to play with. Because there's no neurons in the in V1 that have, you know, V4 size receptive fields or eye movement sensitivity and so forth. No, that's why. Yeah, that's why you have the V4 cells for, and the V4 cells have the etc. You know, to, to to indeed, you know, get that more. I mean, Peter made a beautiful model of figure ground organization where you have this feed forward versus reentrant interactions, exa exactly doing this. All right. Uh, here. Uh, a few points of disagreement uh, <laughs> that I wanted to, to mention. The first yeah. one is that I think you cannot equate visible with seen. So I, I agree very much that there is a seen construction process going on, but yeah. under inattention conditions, it's very hard for me to accept your idea that uh, subjects are seeing more than uh, what they actually say just, you know, 500 milliseconds after an attentional blink situation where they say they saw nothing. Uh, but I wanted to s point to another point of disagreement, which is the, uh, the Freisel experiment and the no-report paradigms. We all agree that it's nice to have no-report paradigm, or rather a sort of indirect report of what the subject saw. But there are paradigms that are better, I think, than this particular experiment that clearly show that you still get uh, prefrontal cortex encoding uh, for a certain duration. Uh, I'm thinking of uh, Fanis Panagiotaropoulos uh, with Nikos Logotetis recording from populations of neurons with uta arrays in the prefrontal cortex, the parietal cortex, and showing actual neural vectors coding for what the monkey is seeing. Uh, it's a complete no-report paradigm. And you see the rivalry occurring in this, as well as in the IT cortex, as was reported before. So I think we should be careful uh, with the null effects, basically. It's not true that there is no frontal activity in this no-report situation. Well, of, of course, at least the situation is that the, say, garden variety uh, global workspace ignition uh, neural signatures, like P3B and what have you, which have been used in the past a lot to, well, I would say defend this position, uh, well, are now shown to be, well, not, not really the story. And of course, it could entirely be, and indeed this, this experiment nicely shows that, that regardless of report or not, you still have some prefrontal activation. Uh, yeah, but whether this is fitting the whole idea of you know, the global ignition and what have you, that's of course a different story then. <laughs> yeah, I'm not surprised you think this. <laughs> All right. Yeah, I think that if you are looking at the things, uh, at, what you're at, the, at the relationship between learning and yeah. using this percepts and <coughs> the actual integration of, uh, of the visual information into a percept, I think uh, it would go the other way around. So you start with learning, very simple learning, that is not yet based on integration, and a very strong uh, selection for learning, more and more complex features of the environment would lead eventually to some kind of feature integration which can be learned as well. So if you're starting from learning, from the evolution of learning, you're starting from processes that are, fr from functions that are used, that have some kind of uh, teleofunctional effect. Mm -hmm. uh, to your functional effect, and then you end up with a system that can do, uh, uh, that can do integration. The, rem the level of uh, dissociability of this, uh, uh, of this system, of perceptual integration, with the systems of using it, is, an op is, is a very interesting question. From an evolutionary perspective, I would expe I expect that there will be some kind of relationship, <coughs> but there can be also some kind of autonomy in, uh, in some, uh, uh, and the degree of autonomy may be modulated by uh, attentional systems. But I think, that, but I think that an evolutionary perspective st very strongly suggests that you will have s some kind of relationships with, uh, with the, the kind of ways in which the percept is actually used. Because the evolutionary perspective sort of goes, the, 
exactly the opposite uh, direction from what you are suggesting. Oh, of course, I can I can entirely imagine this from an evolutionary point of view, which is of course has a much longer time scale than you know what happens in our lifetime. Uh, this this may be the case, but of course, what I'm arguing for is you know more like what happens during our lifetime, being that if we are exposed to a lot of perceptual organized percepts, we we extract and learn information from that, uh, and then if, yeah, at some point this may be it may provide uh, a benefit for. Uh, selection and then it gets embedded much more a priori in the system. Yeah, but what I'm saying is that if you go from evolution, what evolution can tell you is that you should expect some kind of relation. Well, then, then I'm perfectly happy, yeah. <laughs> perfectly happy with that. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you.